first of all, I want to say uh, today is a great day to be alive and to study Torah, uh, to remember the words of uh, the Holy One, blessed be he, and Moshe Rabbeinu. And today, uh, I hope to be able to share with you an idea and a thought that comes out of Shemini, this today's Torah portion. And as as I normally do, and I think it's it's probably some way it keeps me balanced, but any time that I go to share with you ideas that come from the Torah, I'm reminded of how inadequate I am to be able to do that. But at the same time, in, in Hashem's loving kindness, He allows wisdom to flow down even to the lowest level, like water that flows from a mountain. It's always going to find its lowest level. And Baruch Hashem, we are delighted to know that the, the flow of Torah even in its wisdom, can affect so... It, it does. It affects every generation. It affects every human being, whether they realize it or not. No matter how low they are, Torah wisdom affects them. Whether you, even people that are involved in other religions or no religion, somehow the word of Torah filters in and purifies the soul of man. So today I'll bring you uh, some ideas. In... in the portion for uh, today, Shemini, uh, we're all pretty familiar of the text. It's actually a very beautiful text. As a matter of fact, lately um, in my meditation, I've I've been working on something that uh, a, a fellow Jew uh, sort of reminded me and helped me with this, and that is using your meditation and your prayers you visualize in your meditation uh the beauty of what you are meditating for example uh one person said uh, this person said that he pictures himself standing in the court outer court of the temple and he takes time to feel the the cool breeze of the jewish uh, of the jerusalem and the smells and incense of the offerings and uh, the, the noise and the chatter that is going on around. And he begins to visualize a day in which uh, peace will reign in the world. Mashiach will be here. And the beauty of holiness will infuse itself in all of the world, all of creation. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know what that's going to look like. But I've decided within myself, and I want to encourage other people to do the same thing. And from this encouragement from this brother to say, somebody's got to visualize this. Somebody has got to start meditating on it. Somebody has got to draw down the, the presence of Hashem into the world so that we can have peace again. We are living in the one of the most chaotic times of, of world history. And if you really paid attention to what's going on around of us, around us, in which I have to be honest with you, I've not paid much attention to, because it's just so, it's so, it can be so damaging to your soul. Earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes across the Midwest, ships crashing into bridges, attack upon the Israeli people, the Jewish people, by the Palestinians, and a continual full-court press by, by evil, wicked people to destroy Israel. Uh, even our own president somehow mustered the words to condemn part of the action of Israel. And if I'm not careful, I know I will become a bit frustrated and enraged by the whole thing. And anger is a real issue. I, deep with inside of me, as much as I, uh, I, I pride myself on being a peacemaker, I have deep with inside of me the, I'm a fighter. I'm a soldier. I was a police officer. I don't have a problem getting in a scrap to defend myself or to defend someone else or to save someone else's life. So I've got to guard myself on a daily basis. Maybe some people don't, but I do. And I don't just get angry. 
things that should bother us and should make us a bit angry, it's all right. Anger is not a bad thing. There's such a thing as righteous indignation, correct? If there's righteous indignation, then that means that there are appropriate times in which you express our, our frustration and anger at a situation. I'm just not wise enough to know, know when those times are as detrimental to your Torah knowledge and wisdom than other times. We can always get a little upset about this or that, but I never want to be responsible, and nor do any of us want to be responsible enough to become so angry that Torah flees from us. God forbid. Ross and I were talking about this yesterday, and we are talking about the process of of, of prayer and meditation and how to focus on, on the positive aspects that's going on in the world when all sorts of negative things are taking place. And then we started talking about how do we know what is true and what is not, what is an illusion and what is not in this world, because there are so many illusions that are either not true or wanting to paint a picture that tells you something else. Our whole history has been wrought with misinformation, whether it is about a particular government or country or whatever. We find out that history, we find out that archaeology changes the whole paradigm when the truth comes out. And it seems that the longer that we exist and the closer that we come to the age of Mashiach, the level and intensity of the chaos and uh, uh, illusion seems to thicken. And those who are committed to their anger and frustration and fear and doubt and unbelief will end up wallowing in this and miss the beauty of the moment. I do believe that we are not only in the most chaotic time, but the most beautiful and incredible time of human history. Why do I say that? Because it, it, it's, it's when difficulties drive itself into your life that you're able to refine yourself like gold tried in the fire. And we come to this text today, and it says that Mos Moshe made uh, a diligent search concerning the goat of the sin offering. And he was really focused on this. This was like something that was very important because of the sin of the golden calf, we're, we're right in the beginning of the divine presence coming into the tabernacle. And of course, we have Nadav and Avihu who have their difficult uh, situation that takes place because of a strange fire. And we won't get really into that right now. But it said that he, as he searched to find out what happened to the burnt offering, he found out that the, the offering was supposed to be part of it consumed, but it was burnt. Said that he was angry at Eliezer and Itamar, his sons of, of Aaron, that were left and was very frustrated with the whole thing. And in the midst of the Torah, God shows us an incident where the most greatest prophet and man of God, directly capable of meeting Hashem face to face and having dialogue with him. Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, loses his temper. Now, I'm not sure, maybe Rabbi uh, Zvi can clarify this, but it seems that this would be the perfect text to help us to understand how easy it is to lose your Torah. So let's continue. Now, there are other incidences in the Torah where Moses is brought to anger, but only after excessive abuse and irritation from the Israelite people, from Pyro, etc. This is not the case here. Besides, it seems um, a bit strange to think that the father of all the prophets, our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, gets angry. Like, no, come on. It, 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 this anger is different. From this, we must learn a lesson and a very deep and important lesson that this verse sits in the center of the whole Torah, the whole Torah, prior and after, smack in the center. 
it is something for Moses to forget the law as he was the one who received the Torah directly. Is it possible that he actually forgot this little segment of the Torah that then Aaron, his brother, shares with him? We can see from this that if anger can cause Moses to forget the Torah, to forget a specific law of the Torah, how much do we need to be aware of our anger and guard ourselves from it? If anger could cause Moses, the father of all the prophets, to forget the law, how much could we lose? Now, look, anger may do more harm than other emotions, and we do understand that. One day of anger can destroy a person's whole life. How many people are in prisons right now because of what we call a crime of passion? How many people have got into tremendous problems and destroyed relationships and families because of an, a, a day or a moment of uncontrolled anger? Through anger, the mind and the body can both become quite disturbed. And one who starts off in anger many times comes to the end in regret. I know that I have had times that I've been upset at my children. or well, It doesn't matter. And you just feel bad after it. It would be great to be able to avoid that. I'm not sure that we can all avoid all anger. But I do think it's a noble goal for a pious person to avoid anger and uh, rest themselves on the side of love and compassion and kindness. One of the things that Ross and I were talking about was how do we know the difference between the good and the bad, the good information and the bad information, that which is wisdom, that which is not wisdom? It's very easy. Anything that is being brought down or delivered to us, whether from Torah, from society, from websites, you name it, if it consists of love, loving kindness, uh, compassion, awareness, sensitivity to others, if that is the byproduct of anything that is spoken, then it's something that I can rely on. However, if something that I am learning or that I'm hearing or information that is being delivered to me, whether by the TV, internet, or a person, if it ends up in chaos and disjointed relationships and anger and frustration, it's something we should reject, reject wholly. Could you imagine if men and women in prison could learn the art of controlling their mind and controlling their anger, what that would do to change their life? And there are many people who have learned that while in prison and got out and became very productive citizens of the world. The issue is, is such behavior can cause uh, one's connection to spiritual realms to absolutely be diminished. What do I mean? When, when one is caught up in your anger and frustration, we've heard it really sort of told to us by the sages of blessed memory that it's the ultimate act of idolatry. Why? Because it shows your lack of trust in the Holy One. Your lack of ability to know that all things are in the hands of God. That anger and frustration means that I am angry because things are not going my way and not happening the way I want to. And these are very, very damaging things to our, our spiritual life. We have to work at having balance, and it doesn't mean that we are anger-free. I'm not sure that that's possible to not become frustrated or angry at something, but I do know that we have to find the balance in, in that. Let's talk about for a moment, I have a couple of quotes here. Rabbi Yohanan, the name of Shimon HaTzadik, uh, he's a very righteous, holy man who does not become anger over the acts of the wicked as a serpent and is not really wise at all. He says, let me repeat this again. One who does not become angry over the acts of the wicked is a serpent and is not really wise at all. 
wow, okay, so it's all right to become angry. It's all right to have righteous indignation. I'm going to tell you when October 7th happened, it's interesting. We now all call October 7th like we used to do 9-11, right? That makes me angry. Why? Because I'm 61 years old and I'm not capable of going to Israel and fight like I used to when I was a young man and went to the Gulf War to become a, a warrior. Can't do anything about it. I'm frustrated. I've become angry at the hatred, the unmitigated gall that the nations have against God's holy people. But at the same time, I understand there's a purpose behind it and we need to be all right with it. Rabbi Schneer Zalman teaches us in the Tanya that anger, which breaks forth as rage, as a, is like, as I mentioned earlier before, a reference, worshiping idols. If one really believes that all things happen in the world is because of God's doing, then why in the world would I become angry? Why should I be bothered by these things? And this is one of the foundational essence that if one embodies, you can really begin to handle this and be find a balance. We see from this anger, this lack of belief in God and his providence. Elijah the prophet teaches in his book uh, that we should eat one-third, drink one-third, and leave one-third over for when they get angry, don't overeat. As it is taught in the Zohar that the fat on the stomach has the aspect that causes us, causes it to hide one's correct thought process and intellect. This causes one's brain to be ruled primarily by the severity and aspects of kindness. It becomes restricted. This is why the fat and the animal is so important to put on the altar because it shows that it's the pleasure centers. It's that which becomes unchecked. And sometimes anger, anger can satisfy a negative soul. And we got to realize that we have to be willing to give that up. The Milter Rabbi teaches that faith is a light that surrounds the creative inspiration called wisma, chukma, which this, or from this, we see that anger causes a disruption in the process of thought that leads to creative inspiration. If you want to have creative inspiration, then you've got to evict anger's control in your life. In such a state, it says, to put it simply, one can think clearly when you do not have this anger. Rabbi Shimon Baruch Hai tells us that memory is as is as as an aspect of the light of Kukma, creative inspiration. Memory is a wisdom that comes from the flash of lightning, and ultimately we understand that all wisdom comes from Hashem. It may be as the sages teaches us concerning the King David that it actually or really is not within his nature to sin, but his life comes to teach us about tshuva and repentance. Why? We talk about King David, and why in the world would King David, being such a lofty, righteous individual, would fall so low? Why? Because we need to understand that all of us have capable, uh, uh, we have the capability of falling and, and disappointing ourselves and other people around us. So too, Moses' anger in this parsha only occurs to teach us one of the greatest effects of anger and that even the greatest holy people can become angry. And we must all guard ourselves from this. You know, it's interesting. It says that the matzo that is to be eaten on Pesach here soon is called the bread of Imuna. that our faith will be of such high level that even anger is not able to interfere with the awareness that this faith brings. Now let's go through this again. Matzah is made in haste. It's quickly made. It's put together. No time wasted. It's done. And so this idea that like, like matzah, if we're focused on the important act 
if we're focused on the important aspects of Hashem and wisdom of Hashem, then we don't want to hasten or we don't want to waste time with anger and frustration and, and all these things that hinder our ability to do this mitzvah. Yesterday, while my daughter was having some heart issues and the she called me and she said, hey, I'm, I'm at a gas station with the kids and I'm not feeling well. I, uh, my hands are tingling. My tongue is tingling. I can't hardly hear. I don't know what's going on. So on the way, I called the ambulance and I get there with my wife and my grandson says, I need to use the bathroom. So my wife takes them into the little convenience store. When Levi comes out of the convenience store, he is licking on a popsicle and said, Papa, while I was in there, I was doing mitzvah and praying for mommy. She's going to be fine. It's an eight, eight-year-old boy. Eight-year-old boy. He wasn't crying. He wasn't upset. He was focused on what? Doing mitzvahs. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> doing mitzvahs and praying for his mother. Man, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. How focused is that, that we as human beings should be like an eight-year-old boy who's full of the spirit of Hashem, who doesn't panic in tragedy or panic in fear, but runs to do a mitzvah. He was running around the store to try to find things to do for other human beings that were in line he wanted to go shut cabinets and arrange things on the shelf. Whatever he could do as an eight-year-old to do a mitzvah. It really hit home when I began to read the text and remind myself of the text of Moshe, reminding us the power of frustration and fear and anger. Guys, we're living in a time where it is so easy to be overcome with these emotions if we're not careful. We can study Torah every day, well, as we do. But if you want to destroy the wisdom that comes out of Torah, like I would say, destroy the nutrition that comes out of food, can you, you know, we can do that. You can actually have gut problems that you can eat all the most healthy food that you could eat and it still not get processed for your nutrition and benefit because you are don't have the sustenance in your stomach to process the nutrition. It is so easy for us as human beings to get so caught up with the vicissitudes around us, all the difficulties and the tribulations and whatever else. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not sure the world's that bad off as bad as much as the whole media and cabal wants you to think it is, but it's immaterial. Why? Because we need to settle in to the lap of imuna, faith, and find ourselves connecting at the highest level. This is why I mentioned earlier about this whole idea of the fat and the, the fire. You know, in chapter 9 of this Parsha, of our Parsha, describes the first sacrifice offer, offered in the Mishkan. This was a inaugurational ceremony, of course, and with special sacrifices being brought both by Aaron and the Jewish people. At the conclusion of the chapter, it's written, and the fire, quote, came down from before God and consumed the burnt offering and the fats of the altar. All the people saw and cheer and fell on their faces. I use this as part of my personal meditation to think when Mashiach comes and the temple's built, one day, you and I are going to witness people cheering as the smoke rises up from the temple in Jerusalem. We will soon begin to realize that all of Israel becomes the Temple Mount and all the nations, all the world becomes Israel at some aspect and will be unified with Torah and knowledge and wisdom. The inauguration of the Mishkan appears at the end of Shef, the Sefer Shemot, 
and the Parsha Pekudi without any particular ceremony after describing how Moshe constructed the Mishkan on the first day and then continued on for several days, making sure all the, the de details were followed, attention to detail, concludes with the words, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of God filled the Mishkan. Shemot 40, 34. In our Parsha, it says, and fire came forth from before God and consumed the burnt offering and the fats on the altar and all the people saw and cheered and fell on their face, 924. The presence of God on the altar in the fire, which consumed the sacrifices and the glory of God appeared before all the people in the cloud, which Moshe, Moshe entered. What is this telling us? That if we want to see the age of Mashiach and the divine presence to come, of course, we all have the presence of God everywhere. There's no place where God does not exist. We're talking about the Shekinah, as Rabbi Avner have said many times. We ever expect it to come down like that again, then we're going to have to present the fats of our pleasure on the altar of Hashem, the altar of Torah, the wisdom of Torah. We have got to be willing to take those things that, that tend to... Um, be a distraction to us and offer it to Hashem. He's not asking you to sacrifice yourself. He's not asking you to dismember yourself. He's only asking you to release those parts of our lower level animalistic nature to him and say, okay, Hashem, this is all I can do is to offer this to you. Now I need you to help elevate me to that place. If you want to be elevated, it's about presenting yourself to Hashem. We see in the Torah how Aaron and his four sons had spent several days preparing and practicing. Moshe, on the eighth day, calls Aaron his son. And the elders of Israel, Moses explains to each of them that work will need to be done in the Mishkan, every detail, on the eighth day, who would slaughter the sacrificial animal, who would throw the blood of the sacrifice, where it would be thrown, all the details of the service. The eighth day is always special and in a, uh, it involves what belongs and, and is beyond this world. We've studied about the eighth day. The eighth day is uh, is is a time beyond is a is beyond time and space. It's a it's the highest level. Of connection with Hashem. Boys are circumcised on the eighth day. On the eighth day, there are so many references throughout the Torah. And it said, God said to Abraham, and throughout the generations, every male shall be circumcised at the age of eight days. Genesis 17, 12. Also, it is written of a woman at childbirth. When a woman is at childbirth, bears a male, she shall be unclean seven days, and from the eighth day on as uh, as uh, from the eighth day on, as an animal is accepted uh, as an offering, Leviticus twenty two twenty seven. Rabbi Shlomo Ephraim of Lunsk explains from the uh, the concept of a woman's menstrual's uncleanness due to the sin in the Garden of Eden, where it. Not for this sin, man would be like an angel of God, this source being higher than the seven planets. But due to his sin, he falls from his lofty spiritual state, and his soul source begins uh, begin higher than the seven planets, has no longer revealed itself. Uh, instead, man has become a, a subject to mazel. He's being uh, a subject to God's providence through the through the through the planets, through nature, through the organization of the universe itself. I present all of this to say that righteous anger is a good thing. But here's the thing. We don't want to become serpents of our anger and lose our Torah. So the lesson today that I want to bring is this. Because of the complexity of the time that we live in and our thirst for knowledge and understanding of Torah, don't forget 
that it is important to completely envelop yourself with imuna, faith, and trust in Hashem, no matter what takes place. Focus ourselves on doing what is supposed to be done. Why was Moses angry? It was because he thought something had fallen that shouldn't have fallen. Something broke that shouldn't have broken. And it's a lesson to us to realize that we can't afford ourselves to be so obsessed with the details of how you think life should run that you destroy how your life should be going because of your frustration and anger, like things aren't working out the way I want them to. That ultimate faith is us trusting Hashem no matter what takes place around us. I want you to be encouraged, be full of the spirit of Hashem to mitigate the negative forces that are around you. Don't allow them to take over your mind and your thought. Divorce yourself from the negative aspects of the past. Divorce yourself from the negative actions that you have taken in the past. Dive in to a holistic, beautiful relationship with God through prayer of mitzvah. It's simple. Don't allow the the negative forces to come in. The negative forces are now greater than ever. Just as Daniel prophesied in the age of Mashiach that knowledge will increase around the world, the knowledge of God will increase. Well, we understand, and I can't remember of the Hebrew phrase, Rabbi Avner could probably help me, but the idea that if there is such a, a positive force in the world, there's an equal negative force in the world. So if we look around us and see how negative things are, and people are saying, hey, the sky is falling, UFOs are going to show up, aliens are going to be walking in your mall, for crying out loud, <laughs> the Nephilim's coming back, whatever is being taught out there, quit. Focus on love for Hashem, focus on your emuna. focus on doing what brings down the divine presence in your life. May we all see Mashiach soon. May we all see us as a world beginning to improve ourselves and remove ourselves from the evil that's in the world. That finishes my shiur. We'll go on. Who would like to be the first to comment, throw tomatoes, go to sleep, ask a question? It doesn't matter. Who's first?